Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Humans Can Bond with Literally Anything, written by Random3x. Clixus looked over the latest report from Species Resources, informing him that another human on the crew had shown bonding behaviors with other crew members. This was, of course, against company policy. The last thing they needed was someone being distracted during an emergency because they were focusing on their bonded being rather than their duty. To help resolve the issue and further prevent all possible repeat, he had called in the head of human resource representatives. A short buzz rung from a near door to indicate the human had finally arrived. Peter, it is most efficient that you have arrived, Clixus greeted glancing up at the human only to gesture to his seat opposite him. Please have a seat. Sure. Uh, may I ask what this is about? Yes. It is regarding some uh, questionable behavior from the crew member that happens to be human. Oh, uh, nothing too bad, I hope. Uh, I hope not. We were hoping to nip it in the bud, as your dirtling expression goes. Here is the SR report. Handing the data slate to the human, Clixus waited for Peter to read the document. Okay, I'm gonna need some help here. Can you please elaborate on what's wrong here? What's wrong? Clixus parroted in disbelief. Even a no-eyed Vermulian would clearly see the issue. The human has been exhibiting bonding behaviors, which is against SR policies. In response, Peter, to Clixus's surprise, tilted his head. Oh, uh... But there's nothing about sex here. Mating is not the issue here. The issue, Peter, is that they have formed an unnecessary bond. Clixus took a deep breath as his gland sacs had started to inflate, as how annoyed he was becoming. All I see is they became friends. Clixus clapped his hands together, pleased the conversation was finally in the right direction. Exactly. They have bonded, and it is against policy. You are aware of the special dispensation given to our race, right? Yeah, of course. I have read the details. Due to your race's social nature, you would be given some leeway. But this is beyond anything I could allow. Uh, all due respect. But how much leeway did you think to give? I had decided to allow human crewmates permission to spend no more than five minutes of their personal time communicating with their own race, not others. Uh, that's way too little. We are far more social than you seem to believe. Peter, I will not allow my authority to be questioned here. Have your race controlled the unnecessary bonding? Otherwise, I will raise the issue with corporate. I can't do that. Clixus felt his gland sacs threatened to inflate again, but the flat denial. And why not? Simple. I can't override a human's ability to bond. I think you really are underestimating how quickly a human will bond with anything. Yeah, I highly doubt that, Peter. I assure you anything you could find, there will be a human that would bond with it. Seeing Peter continue to refuse to back down, Clixus clicked his tongue as an idea struck him to test Peter's assertion. Very well. How about we put it to the test? I shall prove you wrong with an experiment. An experiment? Yes, an experiment. We shall place, Clixus paused as he looked around the office, this waste paper receptacle, place it in a human hab zone, and we'll see if they bond with it. In response, much to Clixus's surprise, Peter had a smile grow on his face. May I make a few additions to the bin before we start? What additions? Two simple things. I'll draw a pair of eyes on the bin and stick a name tag with a name you choose on it. Seeing no way a race could be so intensely social as to bond with a literal inanimate object, Clixus nodded his assent. He watched as Peter, using a pen, draw a pair of large eyes onto the bin's surface. He then stuck a name tag with Benjamin on it. A name so absurd that Clixus knew no sane creature would form a bond with it. So, we are agreed that you will relax the rules to a more human degree. If the human crewmates actually bond with the spin... Yes, but you cannot influence them. If I catch wind of you revealing the purpose of this experiment, the results will be void, and corporate shall know of your obstinance. 
Peter nodded, only pausing to mutter, Kettle, pot. Clixus was currently beside himself with confusion. His grand experiment had entirely backfired on him within a very short period of time. The humans in their hab had taken to affectionately treating the bin with eyes drawn on it. In one instance, punishing a more troublesome crew member who had kicked the bin over. Never in his wildest dreams would he have ever believed humans would bond with an inanimate object. When Peter had shown up looking smug, Calixus had decided to double down. The ship would be making port with Grumdo Station, a system home to hand-sized eight-legged hunter animals. He had made sure to have one brought on for experiments and released it into the human hab. Seeing many of the humans flee, he began to feel vindicated. Only for that vindication to collapse when a man from the dirtling land mass known as Australia picked it up and gave it a cute little pet on its head, saying, Oh, you are a big beauty. The human had bonded with a Lebox timmer. So have we proven our point? Clixus gritted his teeth, trying his hardest to stop his gland sacs from inflating. You have made your point. Not only did the human crewmates actually bond with a waste paper receptacle, one of them has taken a Lobox team as a pet. <sighs> I shall relax the restrictions on bonding for your people. So may I have my waste paper receptacle returned? In response to the request, Peter suddenly looked uncomfortable. Um, about that. The crew is rather fond of Benjamin, so we aren't up for returning him. Him? Uh, don't worry. We'll make sure to reimburse the ship's stocks for the bin itself. But Benjamin has become a cornerstone of our morale, and to remove him suddenly would deal a blow. I shall repeat, him? I did warn you, we'll bond with anything, and anything we bond with, well, <laughs> they're as good as a human. End of story. Story number two. Humanity is sick. Written by Objective Campaign 82. Humanity. Mankind is sick. Sick, and no one knows the cure. For all the greatest physicians in the galaxy, those who cured death and defeated time, are those same humans. They don't seem to think that there is anything to cure. They die in the hundreds of thousands, and when they go, they die to hearty, hail, sound of mind, with a smile. Before the ascent of humanity and their medicines, death was a predator that got us all back then. It was only a matter of when, not if, never if. Truly, death was the enemy of us all, the humans even more so than the rest. Their world was hostile, an uncaring world. Mother Earth seemed to delight in her hurricanes, plagues, ice age, and hyper-competitive evolution. It was one of the few light-bearing worlds to earn the title of Death World. With all those monumental factors levied against them, no sentient race should have survived. But as we all know, one did. They weren't the strongest, not by their world standards or even galactic standards at the times. Nor were they the fastest, most venerable, or hardest to kill. But they were the most tenacious and clever. They learned the rules of the cruel game called life and learned to thrive. Reports have it that people of the galaxy were terrified of what such a species could do when they finally left their home star. And while there were wars, there was also a golden age of medicine. Because for all the millions of ways to die, there were on a death world, there were also a million diseases, viruses, and infections to cure. Indeed, humanity found themselves facing less virulent problems to solve. They often expressed a sense of disappointment. It may have been this very issue that caused them to turn their attentions to things more challenging. The golden age of medicine brought about many advancements once thought impossible. Xenocompatibility, a reverse to aging, and the indefinite extension of life. With the steady advancements, humanity found ways for all species to share these things. And finally, they defeated death. Not just the dilemma of old age, nor repairing fatal wounds, but a true cure for death. A means by which a soul can be intercepted from its passage to the great beyond and returned to its body. Such a thing seems more like eldritch magics than hyper-advanced science. 
But as living proof of this, I, a person from the tail end of the golden age of medicine, have lived for over 19,000 standard years and returned from death 26 times. And yet, despite all of this, the humans still die, infected with a sickness they refuse to diagnose, and we could never hope to understand. This year, my 19,117th year of life, 2,023 years in this current incarnation, my long-time human partner has passed. After four millennium together, exploring, learning, laughing, and occasionally arguing over taking out the trash, she left me. She wasn't this author's first human companion, but she was the first this author has witnessed the death of. She had all the signs, a soft, constant smile, a look of complete peace in her eyes several months before her death, and the talks of fulfillment. I knew it was coming, but the rumors of humans persisting even after all this gave the author hope that their companion wouldn't leave them. But one day, an inauspicious day, she said, It is time. She professed her love, her joy at meeting me, and bid me to continue on without her. But despite the tears and begging, nothing would change her mind. She went to sleep and chose never to wake again. What madness is within the hearts and minds of mankind that they could ever be at peace with the non-existence of death? They were the ones to pierce the veil and tell us that there was nothing beyond it. No gods, no afterlife, just energy changing form. What joy, what peace, what certainty can they find in such pointless finality that they can embrace it with open arms? I'm not the only one who has seen this. Humans everywhere, no matter the lives they lead, the people they meet, or the things they do, all choose to die one day. It is even stated that those living in entirely human communities experience even shorter lives than those living outside of their home worlds. What sickness must grift their minds for them to say, it's time? Why can't they see the disease that lives within their very minds? Why aren't they afraid? They spend their whole lives exploring, crafting, learning, fighting, and laughing, knowing that one day their time will come, and that it will be a choice they make happily. End of story. If you want more content, there is the compilation, the series, and the one-shot channel filled with content for you. Links in the description. There is a new legend on the horizon. Blueberry Cat has taken the T6 Patreon spot. Thank you very much, and I am sure that I speak for everyone when I say that. I would just like to thank our T5 members. Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Dregzoon WRE, Blueberry Cat, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster 177, and Leslie 517. Thank you very much.